you. So without further ado, let's everybody give a warm welcome to Miss Alicia Bell Hardaway to our program. And a recognition that no matter how many policies you create without the right leadership, culture, framework, mindset, uh, engagement in the work, you're just one moment away from another critical incident uh, that can be devastating. Giving you motivation for growth, two toes down, he keep it realer than most. He do it for the culture, that's always the goal. This is Strategic Moves with Ken Dow. This is Strategic Moves with Ken Dow. Hey, what's up, everybody? You tuned in to another episode of Strategic Moves. I'm your host, Ken Dow. This is a place where we bring art, culture, politics, and business all together. We do it every Wednesday right here on this podcast. But when I'm not shooting this podcast, I am the owner of Strategic Resources, where we specialize in political campaigns, government and public relations work. We've been doing it in this city for over 25 years, and I want to make your next move a strategic move. So this program gives me the opportunity to do just that. Meet some people I've met across the time I've been working here. We come on this podcast and we talk about some of the things in our life that we find interesting that hopefully you may be able to use in your personal or business life. So if this sounds like something that you're interested in, all I need you to do is hit the like button, hit the subscribe button, and the notification bell as well so that you would know the next time this program is coming on. So we're going to get started today. Today I'm really doing a lot today. I had a very, very busy day, but we're going to take some time out to do the things that I like to do most, and that is podcasts and talk to people. So today we're going to do just that. But before I get started, I want to do a shout out to the podcast producer extraordinaire, Mr. Latif. How you doing in there, sir? I'm good. I'm good, man. Right, I'm glad we survived that storm, man. Yeah, the storm was a storm, wasn't it? You and know? I didn't feel the calm before the storm. I just felt that storm. No, I didn't feel any of it. I would have been one of those people in the building that the building would have collapsed on. I was sitting <laughs> up here just my head deep in work doing my thing and i called my son to ask him something and he said man if you know it's a storm outside i said really i said i ain't even looked out there so i got up i looked outside i said it don't look too bad to me and i came back in and sat down and you know what happened the lights went out <laughs> i was like oh snap it must really be a storm the lights went out in the whole building then my paranoia kicked in and I started thinking about all these crazy movies. And I said, you know what? It's really time for you to pack up your bags and get the heck up out of here. And that's exactly what I did. I did not stick around to wait to see what was going to happen. That's for sure. So <laughs> well, my strange about. story was I was checking out a car that I seen and I had to run into the guy's garage because it started <laughs> raining so bad. Hmm. And I was just like, I waited, I waited. And then I just ran to the car and went home. And then my wife called like, I know you ain't driving in that storm. I'm like, I'm almost home. Yeah, see, you got lucky. Then when I made it home too, it was no, you know, I had lights. I know a lot of people didn't, but I did. So that was a good thing. So we're going to get started today, man. I got a special guest in the house today. She is someone who's been in Cleveland fighting for social justice and criminal justice and all kinds of justice for a while. She's been um, sitting on the committee that helped to monitor some of the police injustices that was going on in the city, our consent decree that we had. And she's going to talk a little bit about that. And you're a professor over at, at um, Case Western Reserve. And she's going to sit back and we're going to talk a little bit about it. she's an interesting woman. A lot of people know her and they were happy to know that she was on my podcast and I got to her. And the reason why I keep telling her that is because I started podcasting almost two years ago. And there were people that I said I wanted to sit down and you were on the top 10 list of people. People was like, you got to sit down and talk with her. And I just couldn't get around to getting it all together. And I was happy to know um, that Leah got you on the list. She went back to my list of original people and she said, hey, guess who's coming in? I said, oh, excellent, because I wanted to sit down and talk with you. So without further ado, let's everybody give a warm welcome to Miss Alicia Bell Hardaway to our program. Yeah. 
How you doing? I'm fine. I have to tell you though, it's Aisha. You know, I am the worst with names, so I'm I'm gonna get it right. Are in a good number of folks uh, (laughs) who want to throw an L in. It's Aisha. It's Aisha. Oh, we got it. Aisha. That was what was the girl? Another bad creation. Wasn't that Latif? DJ? Aisha spelled with an E. Oh, that's how they spelled it. Yeah, wow. and um, my <laughs> sister's name is Aisha, and that's spelled with an A I S H A. So well, I know a few Aishas. But you spell yours differently, don't you? I do. Yeah. A Y E S H A. Often it's uh, Arabic. Wow. Uh, and okay. so you'll see it A Y E E S H A, A I S H A, or A Y E S H A. There was a group, a uh, hip hop group back in the day, Another Bad Creation. They made a song called Aisha. It was a little bunch of little boys. They made a song called Aisha. And they talked about a girl they used to love. It was yeah. a little buddy boy. On the group. playground. On the I'm playground. Familiar. There you go. There I'm it familiar. is. There you go. Yeah. So I know yeah, I ain't crazy. All right. I'm yeah. Somebody with me. All right. You know what I'm talking about. I know about. somebody right. used to yeah. probably okay. called you, you, you Aisha from the song. Because that <laughs> right. song is probably about. 40 20 years, years old, old <laughs> at least 20 or more years about old. 30. You got a good about yeah, 30 years old. About 30, yeah, 30. yeah. That was in the 90s. The 90s. Mm-hmm. Interesting. So tell me, how you doing, Professor? I'm doing fine, sir. Thank you for having me. Oh, thanks for coming on our program. What's going on in your world? How's your mental today? <sighs> you know, I think it's good. <laughs> it's good. good Everything is good. Yeah. Um, Try to do what I can to make it from one moment to the next. There's mm-hmm. always a lot to do. So, yeah, yeah. Everybody I'm glad to make it here. And I made it on time. You made I it was on like time. impressed that that happened. Yes. yes. I didn't leave when I was supposed to. So, well, you had backup. They called and said, hey, she's on her way. We was like, okay. We was still working, oh, working, working. Oh, yeah. They good. called and said, good, you were good, on good. your way. I so, we was expecting you. So, you were right on time. Good. So let's talk a little bit about you grew up here in Cleveland. I did. So, give me a little bit of your background. Where you grew up at? Well, um, uh, my parents, I'll, I'll start there. They mm-hmm. met at John Adams High School. So wow. they, my grandmother, my mother's mother, they lived across the park, across the street from the park, Woodhill Park. Mm-hmm. And um, I guess they call it Luke Easter Park now. Yes, yeah, so now it's Luke uh, Easter, uh-huh, yeah. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. And my father's family uh, live over in 123rd and Dove on mm-hmm. the corner there. Um and after a while, I went to elementary school uh, at Miles Park Elementary. Okay. Uh, my mother moved, uh, and we lived in Morris Morris Black for a period oh, of time. Really? Absolutely. Okay. And uh, and then I lived in Georgia for a period of time with my maternal grandparents mm-hmm. uh, on a farm there. Okay. And back and forth, back and forth. When what was it like living on the farm? There, I've lived all over the city of Cleveland, quite honestly, in the in the inner reek suburbs. What was my, it like living on the farm, though? It was amazing. Yeah, it was what kind of farm was it? With, uh, vegetable, fruit, oh. vegetable, and pigs. Oh, and pigs. They did have some pigs. Okay. Mm-hmm. They uh, were our pets and mm-hmm. our sustenance. Really? How long you lived on the farm? Um, off and on mm-hmm. uh, through... Uh, my brother was born in 1988, and uh-huh. so I would I came here, came back here, and was kind of like not going back over the summers once he was born. Okay. Uh, what part was, of the South was you? South of Macon, southeast of Macon, in a small town. I say it's the Sticks. Mm. It's called Dry Branch, Georgia. Dry Branch, Georgia. Yeah. In Twiggs County. In Twiggs County. I Gee, can't make that, it you up. can't you can't get no southern than that. That's right. <laughs> Dry Briggs County, no, right? No, dry Branch. Dry Branch County. In Twiggs County. No, Dry Bridge. I dry get, Branch. Dry Branch mm-hmm. is the city. In Twiggs County. In Twiggs County. Wow. Mm-hmm. Yeah. We all have a mayor. Yeah, I, don't know if, <laughs> I don't know if we call it a city. It's right. A, that's a, 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 a little town, it's right? A little that's town. A, you got a little mayor of the town. Mm-hmm. And all that. Wow, that's interesting. Yeah. Is it still? I imagine place. it's still there. Oh, absolutely. I'll see. Yeah. I'll lay eyes on it this weekend. Oh, you going down? Uh-huh. I try to go back and see the red dirt. Uh, yes, that's very that, grounding that's, and yeah. centering. Yeah, mm-hmm. that is. That is. Yeah. So you you spend some summers down there in Dry Branch. Some school years too. School year. Oh, you went to school down there actually I did. too. Okay. I did for a portion of of my elementary schooling. Oh, okay, okay. <laughs> then you got back up here to the big city. Yeah. <laughs> and then at the end of nineteen eighty, the end of fourth grade, mm-hmm. um, the spring of nineteen eighty four, my mother moved to Shaker Heights. 
Oh. And somehow I've been there ever since. You know, that's that's a, a, a really good mix. I mean, hey, like you say, you started out over Morris Black. Morris Black mm -hmm. went to the South and then came back and went to the Heights. <laughs> <laughs> that's an interesting experience. That's an interesting experience, sure. right. Mm -hmm. yeah. So how old was you when you made it back to the Heights? Um, that was 1984, so I was nine. nine. Okay, so you was in there. And um and uh, uh, maybe I hadn't even turned nine yet. I was eight. Really? Yeah, yeah. I hadn't even turned. I hadn't even turned nine yet. I was in eighty four. Yeah. You know, you make me feel like an old man. <laughs> Jeez, I, I don't do it. Don't do I, it. You oh, don't man. have to feel old. Oh man, you mm -mm. know, I graduated that. high school in like eighty seven. You was nine years old in eighty four. Well, my parents graduated before you, so you were in the mix. Well, well, well before well, you. We, I'm probably in your parents' ages almost. Well, group, no, right? you're younger than them, but yeah. Really? Mm -hmm. Wow. They graduated from high school in 1975. Oh, so you 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 know you've been doing some things then. You were young, still been out there really pounding it. So let's get to it then. So you came back here and you went to Shaker Heights High School. And yeah. um, what was it about your experience growing up in middle school and high school out there in Shaker that you liked? That I liked. Oh, <laughs> yeah. I mean. Uh, it's a special like? place. Yeah, yeah, it's a special place. Uh, Shaker Heights is. Mm -hmm. It is definitely. Uh, um, how do I say? We in in some ways we lived in a bubble, but at the same time we had very very real world experiences. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's a diverse place for sure. Mm -hmm. uh, for a young Aisha, a young girl like me, mm -hmm. to be interjected in a space and place with folks who mm -hmm. don't know anything about Morris Black, much less the country, Correct. right, right. Uh, was interesting. Mm -hmm. uh, but I made a lot of friends early. You move as much as I do. You learn mm -hmm. how to make friends quickly. Okay. Uh, and so I have lifelong friends to this day. Uh, mm -hmm. My best friend is somebody who I met in fifth grade. Really? We went to college together. Really? Uh, yeah, she's more like a sister than she is. A, mm -hmm. a, a, like saying a friend mm -hmm. doesn't quite capture it, do you mm -hmm. know? Mm -hmm. uh, and there's so many folks in our class, our graduating class of 1993, uh, that I think really work hard to make an impact in the world. Um, oh. um, and so even though we were in this bubble, we also had an awareness about the world around us and, mm -hmm. and uh, compassion for ourselves and the people around us mm -hmm. right um and not you know and i i will honestly say that um most people might say the place where they grow up is special but if mm -hmm. i look at my classmates and uh, and the work that they're doing in the world i know for sure they're special really Absolutely. give me an example of somebody and you don't gotta give their names but like you could say in your class you think we, uh, you're special you became a professor any other professors in your class oh I'm sure there is. Mm -hmm. I don't know that Professor is especially special, though. It's, like, it. it's particularly special. It's, it. it's molding I, a lot of great, yeah, smart people. Yeah, I mean, there's that. that. Is. There's that's, that. Huge, that is, that's huge, yeah. though, right? I know that I have some colleagues that are, some classmates that are on faculty, but I'm thinking of, like, mm -hmm. you know, uh, my classmates who are in television. That's uh, what I'm saying. Okay. At, right? Yeah. Right? So Carter Bays creates How Did I Get Away? No wrong show mm -hmm. <laughs> how i met your mother really uh-huh uh-huh okay. um that's somebody uh, from here absolutely wow mm -hmm. um uh a lot of doctors mm -hmm. who are working really hard to provide services to folks who wouldn't yeah. otherwise have medical care services um my my best friend who was uh in a broadway she was in the lion king and the color purple oh. so she sings you know naturally. she must really can sing yeah. she can't sing. <laughs> mariama white i will say her name mariama okay. white excellent uh and um and others who are just really doing phenomenal work uh, whether it's mm -hmm. racial justice social justice work mm -hmm. in the spaces in which they occupy yeah so you went on to college where you go the college of worcester College of what? How did they get there? How, yeah, how that interesting. Happen? Yeah, yeah. Um, they did a tour, and my guidance counselor in high school said, "I know you want to go to an HBCU. This mm -hmm. place is coming here, and mm -hmm. they will pick you up and bring you back. Do you want to go?" And I was <laughs> like, "Where is that? I have no idea." Uh, mm -hmm. And so, me and my best friend, we went on a on a van uh, mm -hmm. and went down for a weekend, and we fell in love with the place largely because of excuse me, how welcome in the community, the black community was on campus. It was very really? small, but very, very mighty, very, very mm -hmm. 
very close, very mm -hmm. proud. Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, the trees and the right. the, the cornfields and mm -hmm. all of that stuff, mm -hmm. you know, felt good to me, too. Okay. Uh, well, well like, that, you felt a little homey. Yeah. yeah that felt good. And it was different. Yeah. You know, now um, cell phones exist. You know, mm -hmm. but we used to call long distance. It just cost right. my family a lot of money for me right. to call home, you know, and <laughs> right. the drive was like a big deal. Mm -hmm. How am I going to get my stuff down to campus? Right. How am I going to get it back? You know, I was there like between it's Cleveland. 60 minutes. It yeah, I was there between Cleveland it's, and Columbus, it's, right? It is nowhere. <laughs> it is exactly. nowhere, but right. having a different area yes. code and at the time costing long distance yeah. to place the telephone call made us feel like we were so far away. You know, it is life kind of does that mm -hmm. you know when you like you say when you was younger and everything else i don't know if the cars were just slower or something yeah. it seemed like life was slower that's what it was life yeah. was just slower yeah. you know my kids um my daughter and my son both play sports and stuff and i know for a fact i used to take my daughter to uh practice softball with her team it was an hour and a half hour drive yeah. there and back. Yeah. And I used to do it like it was no big yeah. deal at all. Yeah. And, and maybe like two or three times a week. And on the yeah. weekends, we would go like it was no big yeah. deal at all. I would all. have had no way to get there. Exactly. As a young person, no, it would right. have, it it have never happened. happened. Right. That's it would never happen. That's not the team you're going to be on. Exactly. You were on the team around the corner because that's yeah. about as far as you, you was going. Walk, exactly. Yeah, you could exactly. take the bus. Exactly. You, you could ride your bike. Exactly. <laughs> oh, you're right. Things are so much faster than. Cause like I'll, I'll say, okay, I'll be on the phone. And by the time I get off the phone, we there at practice. Yeah. Why well, she at practice? I'm on the phone the whole time she had practice or working. Yeah. It was like no big deal at all. But no like you way. say, that was a lot of driving and stuff. Do, yeah, yeah, you wouldn't have been able to do that. No. And even when cell phones came mm -hmm. about at right. the end of my college right time, uh -huh. uh, we had to pay for minutes unless right. it was. Unless <laughs> it was, was worse than the long distance. Unless it was nights and weekends. <laughs> exactly. So you didn't, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So it's nowhere now in mm -hmm. the grand scheme of things, but at the time it seemed. It like seemed like a long. We were leaving. Yeah, yes. we, we left home. Yes, we really did leave home. Yeah. And so, what you major in when you got down there? Uh, sociology and black studies. And black studies. Mm -hmm. Okay. What what brought those on? Uh, I was just figuring it out, you know. Mm -hmm. um, I thought I would be an English major and maybe could have, uh, mm -hmm. and then decided that the study of people really, really intrigued me. Mm -hmm. So that's how I landed with sociology. Mm -hmm. uh, black studies, I come from a lot. My mother and my father are both radicals. Uh, mm -hmm. And so learning black history and learning about our culture, or being immersed in our culture and our people and mm -hmm thinking about what I could do in service of my community was like a mandate from my father. <laughs> mm. So give me some, give me uh, growing up in that type of situation with your family and you say radical as a kid, what would you call radical that you thought your parents was just like doing? Well, I mean, I was just very much raised in the in the black radical tradition. Mm -hmm. That's right? what I mean. And yeah. so, mm -hmm. and so, I had I had a name, Aisha. My father always told me very clearly what it meant. You mm -hmm. know, uh, mm -hmm. uh, the Prophet Muhammad's mm -hmm. youngest and prettiest wife. Ah. Right? I never knew that. Mm -hmm. oh. uh, but that my name meant life, and and my father really really focused on um, helping me to understand the importance of you know, your name and mm -hmm. your place in the world and that being black was a sense of was something to be proud of. Okay. Never to be ashamed and never let anybody tell you who you are. Cause you know, that I came into the world with that. Um, and, and they worked really hard to tell me. And so, you know, uh, I had a Afro as a kid, like really? when my mother would let okay. my hair be out, you know, okay. they would call me little Angela, that kind of a thing. So you was natural. Oh Yeah. Always. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. Not always, what? right? Because I am black American. <laughs> so, <laughs> so we have moments. Uh oh, but yeah, but yeah. As well, a, as was a, they like community involved? Like were they actively involved? Uh, so my father was my father was at Ohio State when I was born. Mm -hmm. Uh and so he was in organizations on campus around um the all black. Uh, I'm gonna screw up the names, but yes. The, and then my mother here, mm -hmm. she has pictures of me with a little suit on and okay. a little briefcase, and we would go to community meetings, mm -hmm. um, all African people's revolutionary party meetings and okay. stuff like that. So just raised very much in a black radical tradition. And then um, you graduated from Wooster, and then okay. what you do? I went to law school. Okay. 
I went to law school, uh, did one year. I got married the week before, did a year of law school mm-hmm. um, and then stayed home and raised kids for four years and then went back to law school to finish my last two years. Mm-hmm. And so I have two wonderful children who are now adults oh, okay. um, and as adults as they can get with me, mm-hmm. insisting that they're still my babies. <laughs> right. I, <understand. laughs> I totally understand that. Uh, uh, and and yeah, so I went to law school. I decided to know? stay in Cleveland. I went to Case Western. Oh, you went to Case? Mm-hmm. Okay. Mm-hmm. Right. I had b- dreams of being in Philly, but uh, mm-hmm. family said otherwise. So I was well, Case ain't a bad place to be. Yeah. No, I, I listen, it is, it is, it is, uh, of great importance to me, the institution and the the well being, and certainly the mm-hmm. the the ability of our students to thrive, mm-hmm. uh, and for Black students, uh, both from Cleveland and elsewhere, mm-hmm. uh, to be to feel welcome and to be in a space where they feel like they can succeed, despite the fact that there aren't mm-hmm. very many, there isn't mm-hmm. necessarily a critical mass, right? Okay. Uh, but that they can thrive anyway um, is really important to me. Did you um, did you work in law? I did. Okay. How long did you work in law and where did you go? Six years. Uh, well, set closer to, I guess, seven, eight. So I graduated in 04 mm-hmm. and in 12, 2012, I came back to the law school to teach full time. Prior to that, I had been um, a mid-level uh, uh, lawyer at Tucker Ellis, which is a law firm here mm-hmm. in yes. Cleveland, but it's a national uh, mm-hmm. law firm. It's headquartered here in Cleveland and was in their litigation department. Made a decision mm-hmm. to go to Case because um, there was an absence of black faculty mm-hmm. and uh, and because at the time, you know, as much as I loved my practice and all of what I was doing, my family also needed me to not be on the road so much. Ah, okay. Uh, I got you. Yeah. Got you. Yeah. So I made that decision thinking it would be a temporary one and I mm-hmm. would go back and make partner and life would be great. <laughs> <laughs> but you end up staying in case. And I ended up staying because I really do uh-huh. um, appreciate the privilege that I have mm-hmm. to be able to, to think capture mm-hmm. my thoughts, right? Um, do mm-hmm. research and writing in a way, mm-hmm. and then hopefully meet the students where they are uh, in a way that makes a difference for them. How long was that case? How long have you been I've been case? there since 2012, so oh. this is my 12th year. Okay. Yeah. So it sounds like you like what you're doing there and everything, and it seemed like they let you do just about what you like to do, it seems like, just about. I don't have any complaints okay. necessarily about mm-hmm. what I'm able to do. Mm-hmm. <laughs> You know, uh, um, my first podcast guest, the very first one, was with Jackie Chisholm. Oh, yes. Yes. And she sat there in that chair. We talked for three hours. Yeah. I mean, that's when I didn't really know what I was doing. But yeah. she gave me three hours She's of her amazing. time. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And we talked about everything. And when I first met her, that's where I met her at that case. Oh, did you? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Uh, her and... Uh, Sabre Scott, it was good friends mm-hmm. of hers. And uh, mm-hmm. we went over to the school when she was a councilwoman and she introduced me to mm-hmm. Dr. Chisholm then. And mm-hmm. um, she's been looking out for me ever since. I, I met her on the campaign trail. Oh, uh-huh. excellent. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. When I ran for school board. You know, when you ran for school board? Oh, um, 2017. For the Cleveland school board? No, Shaker Heights. For Shaker Heights. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Shaker Heights school board. Did you make it? I did. Oh, okay. Top vote getter. Really? Mm-hmm. Oh. Was that... it because I was afraid to lose? <laughs> <laughs> how, how, and so what was that like being in the school system? How long did you do that? I did one term, sir. Oh, just one term. I did. So that was enough for you? It was. <laughs> oh, what did you learn most out of doing that? Oh, um, that whew, the thing that I learned most is that uh it is easy for folks to espouse their ideals mm. about what they want in a community and in a school system. It is very difficult for folks to walk it out. That's with everything. Yeah. Oh, you know, that's that's with yeah. everything. People will tell you in a heartbeat they what will. they want to do. But, they you, will. you know, there's a saying I tell my partner all the time. I say, you know, it says I'm behind you all the way. But the further you get into it, the further behind I'm there. Yeah. So everybody, like, I got your back. Yeah. <laughs> okay, you yeah. turn around and they got your back. Yeah. They back mm-hmm. there somewhere. Mm-hmm. And that's just usually how it goes. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. yeah. No, it was a great experience. I've mm-hmm. served in the community generally for some time, right? What made you want to do it then? Uh, what made me want to do it? Because it was seemed like the next logical step 
and equity mm -hmm. was on the line, mm -hmm. um, making sure that a policy, uh, a committee that I had worked on and had had worked with others to develop a policy around equity for the school system, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. for the district, um, and wanted to make sure that that the powers that be would actually see it through, uh, which they did. Um, that part was uh, was the easy part. But then we had a building catch fire, mm -hmm. a pandemic set in, the That's need right. to hire a new su superintendent, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. all of the things, right? I was there thinking about the priority of this one thing to make sure that students uh, who were uh, in the buildings didn't confront the same things that I had confronted as a student, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, being made to believe that you were less than simply because of the color of your skin or be trying folks trying to make you believe that you're less them because of the color of your skin having teachers tell me like oh you won't be good at this thing because mm. black students just are not good uh having a teacher not not teachers plural but having a teacher tell me that right i thought it was really important to make sure that no other no other student of color no other black student ever encountered that type of thinking so uh, a teacher told well. you that absolutely what grade when i was in Ninth grade, mm. uh, leaving honors English, going trying to make some decisions about what my schedule would look like for 10th grade mm. and was told, oh, even though you did really well in this class, black students just don't excel at honors and advanced placement English. You should go to college prep. Really? Absolutely. Wow. I imagine they wasn't a black person who told you that. No. Yeah. And, and and trust me, it could have been. It but could I, have been. It <laughs> I'm not taking that been. away in any it straight could, woman. It could have been. been, but it wasn't. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, you worked in various capacities within the legal system, but what was the defining moment in your life that steered you towards this tackling this systemic inequities head on? What what was it make you go down this road that you into? Because I hear you talk a lot about inequities even when you talk about when you were going to run for school board mm -hmm. you know it was some inequities you saw in mm -hmm. the school system and something you thought you know what maybe it's something i can do well, tell me a little bit about that and is there something particular in your life that makes you want to have that drive to do that i don't know being alive looking paying attention <laughs> like, i don't know if i can say it's one moment as much as i would say i mean uh, we have the data now right uh -huh. like when i was growing up mm -hmm. we didn't necessarily have the data but uh -huh. you i didn't need the data to mm -hmm. know what it was like to be black in america mm -hmm. right to leave from one place and come to another place and be like gosh did they drop me off in a is this a part of a book i've been reading you uh, know like wow. to imagine that a place like shaker heights actually existed and wasn't fiction right mm -hmm, was mm -hmm. was mind-blowing to wow. me right okay. uh that in and of itself is an inequity right mm. uh mm. uh right yeah. that you could have people Mm -hmm. in the same city right that's correct without like living in poverty that's right correct. while others live in mansions that mm -hmm. that was really quite interesting to me and then to try to understand how or why that was right moving beyond sort of like the oh if you just are excellent if you just mm -hmm. pull yourself up by your bootstraps you too can have no, right like no. right that's not how this works mm -hmm. and so if we are paying attention to the world around us um and 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 thinking about wholesale solutions right mm. um that aren't just on an individual basis right mm -hmm. like the gatekeepers allow one to come in mm -hmm. and then they close the gate behind them mm. Mm. <laughs> right but, but what makes you feel that way though and then you that's say not a feeling it, that's your it, observation it, 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 your observation. Data to prove i know that your data and everything that. but yeah. what makes you feel as if that's something that you want to tackle oh I I don't know that it, that it's a conscious decision about tackling as much as it is just a um, a recognition. Number one, like like my inclination, my personality mm -hmm. is just to tell the truth, there right? It is. All right. And then to feel the responsibility to also like right. tell the truth. There it is. That's why. Yeah. Okay. There it is. Right. Yeah. So it's always been that way for you. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. I think I think if you talk to the people who have known me forever and hopefully love me, they would say you're radical. You can, That's you what can, they say. You can count, you can count on her <laughs> yes. to tell you what true. she thinks yeah. and why she thinks. It. And they, they say she's a radical. That's my that's my girl. She's a radical. <laughs> And they was like, you're going to love talking to her. She's a radical and she's that. So I just really wanted to know if that's what it was. And I know you were sitting nice and calm, but I know that people told me, and I know you've been on some stuff and you done spoke up on some really tough issues. And that's why I really want to talk to you. And let's talk about one. You 
So can, we, can I just really quickly sure. say, it's so interesting too that we think about like, the, that we think of truth telling mm -hmm. as radical. Well, right? and, and, and I get it. I mean, I yeah. get it. I'm not, I yeah. mean, aside from the fact that there's like a radical right right now, right? Like mm -hmm. I wouldn't necessarily like issue the label, right? Because, because it is important. I think of it as, as, as important to not follow blindly with things as they are, but to call out problems, right, in the systems and the policies and the laws, mm -hmm. right, to call those things out, right, because everything isn't hunky-dory, right? hunky -dory. Everything isn't right. perfect. Uh, and, and if you say, hey, have you thought about this thing or have you thought about how this impacts these people, mm -hmm. right, that that's deemed radical, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I might say I'm a problem solver. Well, well see, <laughs> listen, that, that, either that or, or, or I'm bringing new problems for you guys to look at and try Somebody, to figure out yeah. else to solve it. And, mm -hmm. But don't act like there's not a problem. Let's not pretend. Let's don't pretend there's a problem. That's and right. and the reason why I'm stuck on that is because I contend, I come off that way. Mm. But it, when I, sometimes it, it may come off as if, I'm liking the title they gave you radical. They just say sometimes I'm just really either mean or I'm just yeah. really being, uh, uh, you know, you just really blunt with mm -hmm. what you're saying or that kind of thing. But yeah. you, the thing I got from you is that you're a true fighter and, mm -hmm. and, and, and you fight for the truth and you're out there. So that's good. Yeah. People may say, oh, Ken, I don't like that dude because he just comes off really mean. <laughs> And it's a difference. And okay. it's a difference. Okay. And, and they'll say what I mean because I say, well, I told you the truth, man. You didn't like the way I said it, mm -hmm. but I was right, right? Mm -hmm. They say, yeah, but man, come on, dude. You know, you ain't have to do it like you ripped the band off. Bit. Right. Yeah. I'm a band aid ripper off. Let's mm -hmm. get it over with. Sting is over with, right? Mm -hmm. But then but it's good. And and part of being that person who does that and, and speaking out on those things, sometimes you get that title. And that's a good thing. Yeah. That's it's cool. Thing. Yeah, I'm cool with it. Yeah, I love it. I love yeah. it. That's why you're here because we want radical people doing <laughs> radical things. At Cleveland, you've been in a key player in the Cleveland police reform efforts. Let's get down to some of that crazy stuff. What was your initial reaction when they first asked you to join the monitoring team? And did you uh, anticipate the challenges that would come with it? Um, I mean, I. I I couldn't have known all of the challenges, the specificities of the challenges, right? Mm -hmm. But I certainly knew um, that there was something uh, unusual about my engagement and involvement in the process. So let's take a step uh, back because we're assuming that my millions and millions and millions of viewers out right, there millions and millions. <laughs> understand exactly what you were doing. So let's tell everybody, what was the monitoring team and what was that all about that That's you were question. sitting on? That's a fair question. And I should say the consent decree is mm -hmm. live and well. It exists, even though I'm not serving in the capacity that I'm about to describe to you. <laughs> uh, it is still ongoing. Mm -hmm. uh, it is a federal uh, agreement between the Department of Justice mm -hmm. and the city of Cleveland mm -hmm. um, and its police department mm -hmm. to institute a set uh, of wholesale reforms across uh, various substantive areas from use of force, which we think about with police, search stops and arrests, search and seizure, Fourth mm -hmm. Amendment, mm -hmm. um, uh, and community engagement uh, uh, and problem solving. Uh, and so, um, as well as data collection, mm -hmm. technology, those mm -hmm. pieces and parts. Uh, I was asked by an individual who was putting together a team uh, mm -hmm. to place a, a bid, to put in an application to serve as the monitor. The monitor serves as the federal agent to the judge. Mm -hmm. So is not a member of the city, is not a member of the Department of Justice, mm -hmm. but as I like to say, tells the judge how the parties are doing towards implementing the reforms that they agreed to. Mm -hmm. Um, they call balls, ball, you know, call balls and strikes, essentially. A perfect uh, position for you, it sounds like. <laughs> <laughs> sound like they got the perfect person for it. It sounds like to me. And so, and so when I was first asked to, to sign on with the team, mm -hmm. my real thought was like, I need to figure out who these people are on this team and will they really do it with some fidelity? How will many they people really on the monitor? Team? Oh boy, our first. Uh, there were a lot of us. Really? Um, yeah, because uh, the guy who, the man, uh, Matthew Barge, who created the team, mm -hmm. made it a point to have subject matter experts in every substantive area. Wow. 
Yeah. A lot and of so PhDs had, at the table. You, well, you had right. police executives. Okay. So you had police chiefs and commissioners who had mm-hmm. longstanding, mm-hmm. you know, experience in that work, okay. as well as at, um, uh, there was... I was a professor. I'm a professor, one of the professors, and there was another young woman from NYU. Okay. Uh, uh, and then the rest were folks who are consultants um, mm. and had been involved in either like uh, President Obama's 21st Century Task Force on Policing. Okay. Uh, yeah. So, I, you know, I felt like this is the real team. Right. If there is a team, this is the real right. team. Uh, and uh, but still was a little le- leery. Uh, mm-hmm. Had to make sure I understood what their mm-hmm. philosophy around policing meant. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and and you managed the whole team. I eventually did. But when I started in 2015, I was just a team you, member. Just a team member. Wow. Else. Mm-hmm. OK. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. 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 So let's talk about leading up to the management of the team. So that's that's what the team was all about. And, mm-hmm. and, and how many years was you on there? And eight. eight. Eight years? Yeah. Wow. How long is the consent decree with the city? Well, so um, the consent decree uh, will go on as long as it takes for the reforms to be Big in place. place. That's right. Right. Uh, but the county count, the city council budgets for a certain period of time. Right. And That's so right. they, and so when, sometimes when people talk about how long they're the question, you know, I was, mm-hmm. are we talking about city council's budget for, it, or are no. we talking about right. when we project the city this, will be done actually implementing the reforms. Doing those what are is, two, different two different things. Two different things. Those okay. are two different things. So we're going to get in those two different things. We don't have and, to get and, into it, but that's just my overview. Oh, no. I, that, that, <laughs> that, hey, that's what makes good podcast. <laughs> so let's talk about, before we get into that, so there's it, a whole group of you guys, and you guys were getting that together. Who was the first person who was the chief who came in who was monitoring? Matthew Barge. Matthew Barge. Okay. Mm-hmm. And he did it for a few years? And- he did do it for a, a, a few years, yes. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And then they decided it was time to put somebody else in? Matthew Barge decided that he was done and he walked away. Mm. Um, uh, he transitioned to other work. Okay. He mm-hmm. just moved on to something else. He moved else. on to something else. Left a vacancy? He Well, he... No, well, yes, it would have been vacant, but for um, there was an individual on our team who was named as his, who the judge and the parties agreed would be the successor. And that was his name was Hassan Aiden. And so after that, how long was he there? Um, boy, a few years again. Oh, okay. Uh huh. A few years again. It is time, and then he decided he's moving on. Yeah, and that was that happened a little bit more abruptly than Matthew's transition, and that is how I became interim monitor. Oh, that was a little more abrupt. That mm-hmm. just kind of happened. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And before that, I had served as a, a deputy monitor mm-hmm. um, under Hassan. Mm-hmm. And so when he made that tr- transition. Um, I decided that until we could find the new monitor and that that new person's name is Carl Racine. He's out of Washington, D.C., mm-hmm. um, uh, that I would serve in an interim capacity. Understanding and recognizing that teaching, writing, research and writing is my full time job That's and correct. my passion, mm-hmm. uh, but that in service to the community, um, uh, it would be important for there to be some continuity and leadership. So let's talk about the itself and all the continuity and the leadership it takes to do that. How difficult was that trying to pull all those people together and make this thing work? And and do you really feel that there's some significant strides that's being made through this whole consent decree? Uh, my feelings don't matter. That's the judges say so. Mm-hmm. I produced some re- uh, an interim. Well, based off of the reports, yeah, yeah, I produced some reports that mm-hmm. identified where the city had um, opportunity. Uh, Mm -hmm. to make strides uh, Mm -hmm. and provided my summary of what they had done Mm -hmm. up until that point. Are those public records? They are public records. So you can tell me one of them that you thought the city could do to do better? Oh, there, I couldn't. I mean, I don't. Mm-hmm. I couldn't tell you one mm-hmm. of them. Mm-hmm. They're, they're, that wouldn't be fair to the people mm-hmm. or to the, the you know. <laughs> well, uh, well but, it's not to say that they're not doing it. Yeah. No, I'm just saying that in in and where I guess I'm getting that is that the commission was put together to come up with some solutions, right? Oh, the 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 so the, the com- commission and the monitoring team are two different things. I mean, it's not the commission. Yeah. The the monitoring team was to come up with some solutions that they thought the implementation could, and, and process. implementation process. Mm-hmm. Is there any that came out of this that you thought were implemented that you thought were 
good as a uh, as a result yeah. of you guys getting together. That's very, what I'm yeah. Very, well, so a good yeah. thing. Yeah. Very mm -hmm. early on, uh, we made no bones about the fact that the city mm -hmm. uh, adopted at the time, which was a, a leading uh, um, use of force policy, mm -hmm. um, and that the justification required in order to use different levels of force uh, uh, was unique to Cleveland at the time. Mm -hmm. Others, other cities have you know built upon that and and even far exceeded that. But our use of force policy um, at that time and the community input uh, mm -hmm. that went into creating that use of force policy mm -hmm. was hands down, um, bar none, unlike any other process that had happened to that date. And you guys reformed that. We, we, we worked with the city and the Department of Justice mm -hmm. and, and Cleveland community members, uh, yes, to come up with that policy, a new policy. In your opinion, what would you think is some of the biggest things that's holding us back in trying to get this thing together? Um, An think? understanding of the urgency of the work mm -hmm. and a recognition that no matter how many policies you create without the right um, leadership, culture, framework, mindset, uh, engagement, in the work, um, you're just one moment away from another critical incident uh, that can be devastating to an individual, to that individual's family, and to the broader community. Um, and and so and so we can't get weary in well doing, right? Uh, it's really really very important that we not only come up with the words on the paper, but that we walk it out and that and that everyone responsible for the work walks it out. Um, I think that that's, that's a huge effort. That's yes. a huge effort, mm -hmm. you know? Um, and, and we can't assume that just because we make some strides that that's good enough. Mm. Yeah. Would you, would you think that's the most significant contribution the thing has uh, done at this point, you think? I, I mean, I think it's the one that people will mm -hmm. um, um, hopefully be able to identify, quantify, uh, see a difference in the type of use of force used pre-consent decree and the use of force and the accountability mechanisms for those, using the, those uses of force um, post or during the consent decree and post consent decree, I think that's probably the most tangible one that people will be looking for um, on the streets. Oh, I know one of the issues that came up with that was um, the amount of money that um, was paid to the gentleman who's doing that. What's your thoughts on all of that? Is there, uh, and I'm not saying whether it was right or wrong, but I imagine there is a fee to do what you have to do to do the job that there has to pay. Um, any idea of how you feel that it was he is it unbalanced or you feel is is the city really has a, a belief that they're paying too much for it or you believe they just need to get the service done I, I don't know what anybody else believes but i will tell you that um there's always been a complaint about having to pay for this mm -hmm. um and the reality is is that nobody should work for free it's not equitable or just mm -hmm. to ask anyone to, to work, work for, for free. free. That's correct. Uh, and especially when mm -hmm. uh, it's a problem of the city's own creation, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and the reality of the situation is, is that we cannot be satisfied with paying civil lawsuits mm -hmm. to the few that are lucky enough, right, to 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 get their cases heard and remunerated uh, when 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 they've been harmed. Uh, we should want to be better than that. And mm -hmm. we should want to be more proactive instead of reactive than that. That's correct. And having someone work through, having a team of folks work through this process with the city only helps to serve us in the long run and, and, and arguing about the dollars, the, the money that's spent for the services mm -hmm. is like, is like is like for me it's bottom of the barrel it really really misses the point and that's not to say i'm not aware of the fiscal constraints of a municipality of course i am but the reality is is that you're paying them one way or the other wouldn't you much okay. rather pay them for improvement mm -hmm. as opposed to pay them as a punishment and, and the lawsuits that you're going to keep in, in, yeah. incurring yeah. i mean it's just really yeah. let, me, let me ask you all we've got a few more questions i'm gonna let you get out of here because i know you're busy and gotta go um 
someone asks it this way you left you came back and then you're gone you left again right with the um department i was asked yes i was asked to so, leave yeah take me through that whole process yeah, if you don't mind yeah it's 2024 we're still talking about this because you were popular no, listen because you were supposed to be on my show i told you a <laughs> year ago when all of this stuff was going on uh, they was like you need to get her so on and much I, I want to talk about i want to talk about the social justice institute you really? and the think tank that i have but well, I, hold on you know what Listen, you're going to answer that, and then we're going to do the last 10 minutes to talk about that, okay? Okay. okay. All right, so answer this, and then let's get it all into that, okay? You. I really thank appreciate you, that. I, I will say- Because I was making up questions, so I really appreciate that. I'm good. <laughs> let's go. I will just say um, that uh, that moment in time, as difficult as it was, and as concerned as I was about the fidelity of the process mm -hmm. uh, as it related to the implementation of the consent decree, mm -hmm. I was so very, very proud to be- from Cleveland. Mm. I was very, very proud of the folks who said, we may not understand, we may not be involved in the day to day okay. of what's happening with this consent decree, mm -hmm. but we know this individual and we know the type of person that she is, right? Mm -hmm. And 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 what she's being accused of, biased, right? Okay. What she's accused of being is so far from the truth and mm -hmm. is beside the point. Mm -hmm. uh, and that they want it me to be present on the team um, Got it. to monitor right mm -hmm. the the reform effort um very very in a in a space where you might imagine as a black woman i'm often isolated one of one of one or one of very mm -hmm. few mm -hmm. um to have folks from all segments of my of the community sort of like recognize the issue and the concern here not for me personally but really for our community as a whole mm -hmm. was very very heartening i got you it was very very heartening it made me very very proud and it makes me clear about what we're capable of right when we stand with each other Excellent. uh uh for what's necessary for us you know I appreciate that and, and you coming on sharing that with us. I know, like I told you, I've been trying to get you on a while ago and when I first started, because you was in the mix of all of this when it was going down and I wanted to really get a chance to talk to you and get your side of everything. And just because, like I said, you're very interested. You was on my top 10 list of people no, uh, who supposed to got in here the first top 10 <laughs> podcast. So, Professor, now, why don't you tell us? I got my little questions out the way. Yeah. Why don't you tell me what you're working on? What you're doing now? What's yeah, going on? So, uh, so some of the same stuff I've always been doing, but mm -hmm. with a sharper focus and a okay. little bit lighter calendar, mm -hmm. uh, okay. which is nice. Mm -hmm. uh, so I direct um, the Social Justice Law Center at the law school okay. and I direct uh, the university's Social Justice Institute. Mm -hmm. The Social Justice Institute was founded in 2010. So okay. it, was came about before I ever uh, was even at the school. Mm -hmm. uh, the founding um, a director is a woman that, by the name of Dr. Rhonda Williams, oh, and she created the space. I'm sure you have. She she's now um, at Wright State in Detroit, Michigan. But mm -hmm. she created the space and the opportunity for me to like flourish as a junior scholar. Okay, uh, coming from the law school that mm -hmm. was uh, the opposite of radical. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> okay, okay, right, right. Uh, being in that space, uh, but wanting to think about solutions for the problems uh, that confront my people. Hmm. Uh, and so I was right, working on a piece around reparations. And really? the Social Justice Institute was a home for me, it was an intellectual home for me, for sure, on campus. Uh, had the opportunity um, uh, under the old provost, uh, Ben Vinson, to be appointed as uh, in leadership of, of the Social Justice Institute back in May of 2020. Hmm. And, um, and so we're holding now for this, right? Oh, it's my third. Is this my third think tank? I think this is technically... Can that be right? Yes. Technically, so the first think tank we held was uh, on Zoom because it mm -hmm. was right, right, right in a pandemic. Mm -hmm. um, the second one we held was two years ago. Mm. Um, uh, and this year we're hosting our next think tank. Mm -hmm. uh, it's my first, it, uh, uh, it's the, the think tank I did that I participated in as a junior scholar mm -hmm. uh, was when Angela Davis was our keynote speaker. I remember she was here. Do you remember yeah. when she was yes. here? Okay, exactly. so then you know, yes. this is our intergenerational okay. think tank. It okay. is our, our marquee event, if you will, okay. held every two years. Okay, uh, and when uh, is it gonna be? It's going to be October 25th and 26th. Oh, okay. So we're gonna 
going to have a community reception at Red Dog Gardens on okay. Friday, uh, October 26th. Since we right around October, I'm going to air you closer. Oh, will you? To there so okay. we can do it. And we're going to make sure when we end, you get to do a little promo in okay. here so we can push that's it out I, there. That's what us. I wanted to do there. Excellent. Yeah. Okay. Beautiful. Uh huh. Okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, and then on the 26th, which is the Saturday, mm -hmm. we'll have a host of, of, of panel discussions and a oh. keynote uh, speaker. You know who that's going to be yet? I do. You want to tell me? You want to give us a little? Uh, we're coming in October, so we're going to be close. Uh, yeah. You want to hold let it? Let me just say, <laughs> let me just say, y'all want to be there. Y'all want to be there. Y'all want to be there. Uh, that's cool. Uh, but he's confirmed. Oh, is it he? Yeah. We got a little bit out of uh -huh. it. Is it uh, he? The okay. The speaker is confirmed, uh -huh. and, and, and I'm really, really excited about yes. uh, what he's going to share. Okay. Our theme is uh collaboration we're be we're better uh hmm. together we're better we're stronger <laughs> let me get this together <laughs> our theme is collaboration mm -hmm. we are stronger and better together yeah, there it is yeah excellent yeah excellent I, that sounds like you got some good stuff going on you're really happy about that you yeah. was really you lit up when we talked about that i'm, excited like, about I'm ready to talk tank. about that that's what i'm yeah that's a big <laughs> and tell me what's what you expect to get out of the think tank and all of the stuff that you're doing with it I love the creating the space and the opportunity. So it's intergenerational, mm -hmm. and 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 even though it's on a university campus, mm -hmm. uh, what I love about it and what other academics who come mm -hmm. uh, to our space for it, they're like, we're here, and there's so many community members here. Mm -hmm. Like I don't know if I've ever been in a space where it's just like community, mm -hmm. community, community. Mm -hmm. Where is located? At? Uh, so we the last two have been held in the Tinkhamville Center okay. uh, on Cases Campus, which mm -hmm. is on a street called Bellflower, like at the oh, intersection yeah. of Bellflower yes. and, and and Ford. Now you you guys not yeah. going into that house, Julian Rogers? No. No, oh, that's something totally that's different. Some, yeah, he's community okay. and government relations. Okay, because yeah. I know he said he was they rehabbing a house yeah, over there or something mm -hmm. to do yep, community stuff. And I've seen it. Yeah, yep, okay. Yep, 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 okay. On the edge of campus. All right, um, so that's something different. But the Social Justice Institute is really like a political think. Really? Yeah, think political educational think tank, not just community engagement. Mm -hmm. But what I what I loved about it and mm -hmm. what I got out of it was mm -hmm. I had wise say like sage elders from community mm. who came to my talk on reparations and chapter and verse could talk about the scholars and the really? theory right that i was wrestling with mm -hmm. uh and these are my uncles right like right. like from community uh they don't they don't necessarily have letters after their names right uh but to be able to sit at their feet right and to absorb not just their lived experience but their intellectual prowess mm -hmm. uh is just a very 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 dope time and so that's what i love about think tank it's intergenerational because we have students on campus we have those sage elders from the community and we have academics our panels often have practitioners academics uh uh and the like but they're all as you might say activist leaning mm -hmm. academics right who really want they're not just thinking about theory for the sake of theory they're thinking about theory towards liberation uh, mm -hmm. they want it to mean something and to leave a mark and so are you guys so, doing anything for this presidential election are y'all are you doing any writing anything or reaching out on anything of that? Uh, so we, so interesting, like no surprise to you, because mm -hmm. since case is a nonprofit, uh, mm -hmm. 501 C three, is that right? Mm -hmm. So I, we're not allowed to do partisan pieces and mm -hmm. parts. Right. Uh, but we absolutely, uh, do educate last, um, Last year, we had a research session on voting rights uh, mm -hmm. with my scholar, um, my colleague, who's a scholar in voting rights and election law, Atiba Ellis. Um, so well, I came to the law school uh, for a long period of time. I was the only black woman there, but mm -hmm. I've been sure not to be the only one. Mm -hmm. So I've, there's, since I've been there, there's now Atiba Ellis, who's a black man, and Brian Adamson, who's our Associate Dean of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion. Mm -hmm. um, and so Atiba Ellis, has he does a lot of research writing and speaking about voting rights. Um, and so we will host um, those types of events. Um, yeah. Let me know about all I of those. Will. I will. I will. We have to get you on our newsletter. Yes, definitely. I want to be a part of that stuff. All the stuff you're doing, I like to know, because you, you said a, a bunch of stuff. I got to get you back because you 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 pushed the whole. At, at the end, you got me with aha. That's what all the good stuff is there. Yeah. You're right. That stuff we talked about was old. Yeah. The good stuff is the stuff we talking about now. Yeah, I'm and, excited about it. This stuff is really good, and I I love to have you come back to 
be just a commentator on some of the stuff we're doing. I'd like to talk with other people around here, and we're going to talk about politics. We're going to talk about um, the vote and that thing. But this is my question for you, and this is what I want you to come back about. You feel that African Americans should get reparations? I do. And do you feel that the country can pay, afford to give us reparations? Absolutely. See, that's why I'm going to have a whole conversation we on that We should talk one. about it. And you got to go. I got to let you yeah, go. I know, but I got to bring you back because yeah, I'm yeah, yeah. Like, like, wait a minute. Yeah, yeah, this is yeah. what I need you to come back. Absolutely. And we need to come back and have a whole conversation about that. Yeah, I really appreciate that. And yeah. I appreciate getting the chance to get to know you. Yeah. I got And thank you for coming on our program. I love you. She will be back, people, because we're going to talk about reparations. We're going to talk about what she's doing at the school. And we're going to talk about this election once it's over with. Mm -hmm. We're going to take a look at what happened, some of the numbers, and how did African-Americans do? Because that's going to be the big thing. And it's so much like Kamala, Democrat, Republican. We're going to talk about how did African-Americans do this yeah. election. In the meantime, could mm -hmm. I just ask your sure. listeners to please go to mm -hmm. uh case.edu forward slash social justice. Mm -hmm. Oh, or, well, here, we yeah. gonna, listen, we're about to end our program because okay. Pastor got to go. She got to get up out of here. And but like we end most of our programs, we're going to give you an opportunity to look right in this camera. You can take your time, say whatever you like to say to the camera and the people and how they can reach out to you and all of that. We will be putting all that information in the description so you will be able to get it there. But Professor, thanks for coming on, and the camera's yours. Thank you so much for having me. I just want to ask everybody to come out for SJI, the Social Justice Institute's uh, biennial think tank, intergenerational think tank, October 25th and 26th. Uh, on the 26th is at the Tinkhamville Center at Case Western Reserve University. You can find out more in information at www.case.edu forward slash social justice, one word, or you could email us your... Uh, uh, contact information at socialjustice at case.edu so that we could add you to our mailing list. Thank you. Professor Aisha Bell Hardaway. Got it right? Yes. Yes. Yeah, see, Aisha <laughs> Bell Hardaway. Thanks for coming on our program. She will be back because we're going to talk reparations, people, and y'all going to not want to miss that. Awesome. And I'll talk to y'all soon. Peace. This is Strategic Moves with Ken Dow. 